In this episode, I have Dr. Greg Lehman joining me to discuss controversial topics in physiotherapy. Greg has decades of experience in this field, considering the fact he has studied and practiced as a strength and conditioning coach, a chiropractor, and a physiotherapist. We discuss the different theories around physical load and what it does to the body, when biomechanics and posture actually matter, and the physical activity paradox. Greg is someone I have a lot of respect for because he is constantly challenging the biases in our field, which helps to keep our profession sharp. Hope you enjoy this one. The Prehab Audio Experience will teach you how to take control of your health through knowledge by optimizing performance, promoting longevity, and keeping your movement system in tune. Welcome to your host, the Prehab Guys. Today, we have Greg Lehman, once a Cairo, now primarily a physiotherapist based out of Toronto. Greg is a clinician by trade, but he has also been published dozens of times, as well as he teaches internationally on a monthly basis. Greg is here to talk with me today about the concept of wear and tear versus wear and repair, as well as other topics that may challenge your biases. Greg, it's an honor to have you join the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I've been excited to get this one going since we came to your course out in San Francisco now about a month ago. Yeah. I really enjoyed that course. I think anyone, if you've ever come across uh, Greg's content or you're interested in it, uh, I definitely recommend it as it was two days just jam-packed with a ton of info that you don't necessarily get exposed to, especially when in school. Would you agree, Greg? Uh, I I don't... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think, I think things are changing to be honest. Like uh, I've been teaching this stuff or talking about this for at least 15 years. And so maybe when I was in physio school 10 years ago, uh, you know, they weren't really talking about it, but from what I understand, the, the, things are changing. So for the better off fast, uh, yeah. I, I think so. I think there's some doubling down on old, old ideas as well. So, yeah. And it's tough because even uh, just our experience in school, I mean, I think schools want to protect their students and now where social media is going, it's just like, it's that much harder to protect or to limit how many outside ideas are coming in because it can just mess with their curriculum. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, it's an interesting thing. So Greg, uh, with that being said, can you just give us a little bit of a background about yourself? Uh, how, where are you today? How did you get there? Uh, my undergrad was in kinesiology, um, you know, and I loved biomechanics and exercise physiology, but even then, like I was pretty lucky. I was interested in the biopsychosocial. So that's like the mid nineties. And, uh, and so we didn't call it pain science then, whatever that, that terms, but we, we knew about the biopsychosocial. I just emailed a patient of mine this morning. He asked me about John Sarno and I wrote back and this makes me sound old, but I was a nerd when I was young. I was like, He's like, do you know John Sarno? And I, I said, I, wrote, I first read his book in 1994. <laughs> I was like 20 or, or something, which is ridiculous. So like we, we've been talking about, John Sarno is about the emotional aspects of pain or how like uh, um, emotions can drive physical symptoms. Um, uh, so, you know, so I was interested in like the biopsychosocial aspects of pain and biomechanics and, you know, bi- biology for a long time. And then I went, I did, I did a master's in, in the spine uh, and that just reinforced it. I was lucky to meet a lot of people who had s- similar ideas. Um, they really deconstructed a lot of thoughts that we had with manual therapy and exercise to, to me, simplify things and get rid of a lot of the fluff. So I never had a lot of undoing that a lot of therapists have to go through, you know, like I didn't believe in motion palpation or joints being out of position right from the start because those ideas were introduced to me right right from the start um and then i went to Cairo school i was able to research when i was there and i was in practice for a long time and then i went back to physio school uh, while i was still in practice and then now i'm, I'm still a clinician and just teaching and talking too much <laughs> <laughs> that's how i feel every time i teach a course by the end of the day i'm like i just need to shut up i don't want to yeah. hear my voice for one more second i i hear you what made you go to physio school after Cairo school? I'll be blunt. It was purely uh, pragmatic. 
in Canada and North America, you have way more opportunities as a physio. I, I also want to like, because as a physio, you could be in, in cardio, you, you could be at work with amputees. Like there's just, just, it has more, it has more opportunities. It has more opportunities in the MSK world or orthopedic world. So, um, and uh, I, I knew some of the people at Queens, the faculty seemed, seemed great. Uh, I was able to have a full-time practice and go to school uh, full-time. I don't know how that adds up, but, uh, and have babies. <laughs> That's impressive. So, it's okay. uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we just have a dog and I feel overwhelmed sometimes <laughs> with just a dog. So I don't know. So how. I had a one-year-old and then by the end I had two, but then we had a baby like in my second year. And then the irony, the one problem with, with physio school is a touch out of date. So the second baby came flying out at four in the morning at seven 30 in the morning. I'm out of placement. And so I'm, I'm with a patient. I have to do what they tell me to do. She had patient had CRPS and they had me doing ultrasound on her hand. <laughs> so I was like, why am I in school when I'm doing this nonsense? But that's okay. Yeah. They cared. Yeah. I mean, Hey, yeah, I'm, you learned what you wanted to take from it and what you never wanted to do again. Right. That's totally. What I tell students all the time. Yeah. It's, so this is what I really want to jump into, and I hope you can break it down. So, you know, we have clinicians listening in, but we also have the average person tuning in as well. So with that being said, I want to dive into this wear and tear versus wear and repair model. So I think at first, if we just separate what each one means, and then, you know, you mentioned this at the course, but like, what, let's dive into this. And where is the debate? Where does it stand? Yeah, I, I mean, the debate is essentially like what, like what is our view of load on the body and on people? What is what does physical stress do to our joints, and what does that mean for function and and pain? Is is physical stress a, primarily a force for good, or is the body something that really needs protection? You know, if you deviate from ideal postures are you going to pay for it later if you're if you're too if you're active when you're a kid or in your 20s you know are you going to pay for it later that that that's sort of the 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 debate in there um and so that's the wear and tear hypothesis where you know our our bodies are doomed to fail you you use something over time and and the joints will will break down uh, even though you might be feeling fantastic uh it's that again i'm repeating myself but you'll 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 pay for it later that's the it's the body as this falling apart model um and then the other concept which isn't totally mutually exclusive here but it's the wear and repair which is you know physical load is a catalyst for positive changes and you know we get the dose right regardless of posture or position you know you're able to adapt positively to that um and maybe your joints change change but you can tolerate those joint changes and you 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 thrive with 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 load and Where, sorry go ahead i know keep going and and i would say like what in between that and i don't even agree with this either is sort of the um i was going to say the cinderella but it's not the cinderella hypothesis it's the other one it's the goldilocks it's the <laughs> it's the u-shaped it's the idea too little load is bad and too much load is bad and that's what most people probably uh think they are but i would even question that sometimes um mm -hmm. and i and i sh and i should say i have more questions than answers here when you read a lot on this it it's it's not a straightforward topic that's that's for sure i sent you that whole like a bunch of papers on that and i don't know if you dove into it all but i'm i'm still diving um, it's dirty me too i'm writing a keynote on it in um for april trying to find something some 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 common thread or some take home message and it's it's messy yeah. And the more time that you spend on the topic and the deeper that you dive into it, you almost have to take 10 steps back because then you start questioning, what do you even know? And you're like, yeah. am I even understanding this? Am I grasping this or am I just making myself more confused? That's yeah, how I feel. Yeah. And let me, can I give you an example of that with a re research paper? 
please. So it's the Voynier paper that just came out. Um, and, and I, and it's hot, highly detailed. It's a great paper. They did, they did a great job, but, uh, and it looks at sort of this, this, uh, Goldilocks hypothesis where if you load too much, are you more likely to, to have Neo A? And if you load too little and they say, yeah, that's supported, you know, but then when you look at it, you're like, they kind of got, I'm judging them, but it, it feels like they just pick some of their results and focus on some results that supported that and didn't look at the totality of their results. Like, so an example would be um, people who have a high BMI. They looked at that people at high BMI and they compared their knee OA prevalence um, uh, when you had high BMI versus number of steps, right? So if the U shape hypothesis is accurate, it would mean you have a high BMI, and you have a high number of steps versus a low number of steps, right? You, you should have more uh, degeneration, right? Does that make sense? They didn't find mm -hmm. that. All they found was if you had a high BMI, regardless of the number of steps, you were more likely to have NEOA versus someone who had low BMI, right? So the load itself, you know, being overweight wasn't the issue. Uh, sorry, the load itself co compounded with taking number of steps that didn't didn't increase your risk of of knee or hip OA. Right? Yeah, it it was just the fact that you're overweight and and being overweight has other metabolic contributors to to pain and sensitivity and joint changes. It may not be the may not be the load at all. Yeah, right. Or if load is a variable, maybe it's a tiny factor. And then if if people want to dive into that paper because it's a nice start, you'll see even though there was more medial you know, tibiofemoral joint away. I can't remember exactly what it was um, when you're overweight versus not being overweight. It wasn't every part of the joint, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't always in the patella or my, my, it wasn't every joint. So it's like, it's almost like part of the joint dependent. And if it's mm -hmm. all, if it's just about load, then it can't be. There's something else. There, there's an interaction between where, where we have it as well. Yeah. And, you know, you've definitely, you're a little bit more read up on this topic than I am. So I'm just going to keep picking your brain about this. Where do you think the wear and tear model historically comes from? Like where are its roots? Oh, I, I, I don't, I don't know, but I would guess that's just, uh, it, we, we, people probably made that observation a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. right? They, cause it's true. As you age, there's definitely a change in our, in our structure. Yeah. And so we just assume that that structural change was an interaction between your genetics and the environment. That's mm -hmm. the wear and tear hypothesis. And, and I, I can, I more say like who challenged that first, that idea. Uh, and I don't know, was, but there's a researcher and clinician named Bland who would have said this a long time ago saying, no, no load is good for the joints. It, it, could, it could maybe even reverse OA or, or make the cartilage get stronger and adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he talked about that. And then the people I know well are, um, are Michelle Batchier and her husband is, I forget his first name, but he's finished vitamin. And they were publishing in the, these twin spine studies where they, they really challenged the wear and tear hypothesis because they would look at twins and, and you know the study, but they, the, the heavier twin or the twin who lifted more throughout his life was not more likely to have, you know, more spine degeneration. Mm -hmm. And what they said, it was just genetics. Like that's, there's, that's the other idea. Like maybe we should just forget about load, you know, and joint changes. It's, it, it's such a tiny factor. It's not worth worrying about. Yeah. I'm, I, that's kind of where I'm going now. Like, let's just stop talking about it and work on things to manage. It's like running related injuries. Sorry, I'm way off topic, but like, <laughs> We would we should just assume most runners are going to get injured. It's going to happen. So what mm -hmm. you do is you manage you manage the pain and manage the injuries and what's going on, rather than thinking you can prevent it. And mm -hmm. I think that might be what we talk about with NeoA. Just assume you're going to have these joint changes, but make that person as healthy as possible to tolerate the change in function and potential pain that they have. And th like that's what we, we almost what I think we should do. Yeah, just <laughs> identifying the factors that we can manipulate. Yeah, like just don't think about joint structure anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, don't like, because what, what, one of the arguments, uh, Aaron Macri is a great, 
young researcher and she has a paper with the most trial. I forget what most is an acronym for something about something. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and there's another Lena Sharma and, and gross, these great researchers, but they kind of look at alignment. Like if you're more in varus, so bow legged, um, the argument is you're, you're more likely to develop medial uh, tibial femoral OA. And, and there is some research that supports that. So it says, ah, oh, look, if there's more load on the inside of the joint, you have more OA there. But the, 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 the question kind of is, you probably can't change your alignment. You can't do much about that. The odds ratio isn't that, like it's not like it's destiny to have pain. So maybe you don't even worry about things like alignment or how you walk. Yeah. And I mean, if you, if you really want to adjust it, I mean, you're talking potential like big surgeries, osteotomies or exactly you know, other big interventions that in reality, you're just going to shift the stress to somewhere else. And I think that yeah. goes back to running where, you know, I, I think runners are just creatures of habit. Like I got on a podcast with Chris Johnson a few months ago and the best advice that, you know, he gives to runners is, change up your shoes, change up your pace, change up your route so yeah. that you're throwing in different stressors because running is, you're just setting yourself up for overuse injuries, especially if you're doing the same thing over and over. So it's just, how do we, how do we share the stress and share the load in the different structures? Yeah. I mean that, but it's funny, but sometimes I, I jokingly a while ago, that's what I said with the patient. So what do I do? I don't know. Just change something. <laughs> <laughs> like, what am I paying you for? I'm like, I don't know. It's quips. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's true. It's that, mm -hmm. that that's often the variable and you just, sometimes you just, you, you get lucky and you figure out the right thing to change. Yeah. And you know, going back to what I mentioned earlier, the wear and tear, like where it came from, what I always imaged was, you know, it's just, the conversation that always got brought up with physicians or radiologists or anyone that handled imaging, because you only get an image done when you're dealing with an issue. Yeah. And more often than not, the, the common factor with imaging is you get it more likely when you're older and you're getting it more done. Uh, you're getting it done more frequently when you're older, or whenever you're dealing with an issue, with an issue, they do an x-ray and it's like, Oh yeah, the joint space is, it's gone, you know, and yeah. there's all these arthritic changes. So that's why you have issues. But, you know, I think if you could even educate us a little bit about the process of osteoarthritis, because I think some people, they go run, let's stick with the running example today. They start running, it's the new year, all right, middle of February, my knee's been bothering me for the past four weeks. Let me go get it checked out. I get an x-ray done and now the doctor tells me that I have arthritis in my knee and it's bone on bone. And then they go into the physio session, they see you and they are just hounding you the fact that it's bone on bone. So what are you going to do about it? So I'm uh, I'm not an absolutist. I'm not willing to say that structure is completely irrelevant. I want to, you know, I definitely did that stuff 10, 15 years ago. But I would, what I would say is that there's the structure is one small contributor to, to pain and sensitivity. Um, but it's not like I structure is not destiny. It doesn't have to cause pain there. Uh, we should work on the things that you can change, which could be your strength training, how you run, you know, how much you're running, what your, what your recovery looks like, your, your sleep. And we acknowledge that maybe the structure is one little piece of the puzzle, but it's not a, big enough piece to really fill in the whole picture right so so uh, I, I don't like to say that it's completely irrelevant but it's not something worth worrying about because you can recover you can be out of pain you can be running three times the volume and greater intensities and your joints can look identical on the x-ray and you can be doing fantastic that, that that's how I, how uh, how I sell it yeah, because it's it's shifting the focus back to the things that we can manipulate. It's like, exactly. well, what what are we gonna do with the structure here? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wrap my hands around you and do some voodoo energy to it to change the structure, you know? It's 
it's understanding the factors that we can manipulate and then just changing their focus. Yeah. And so what I, what I focus on is like knee osteoarthritis is it, we don't really think that it's painful because of the structural change. If we think of anything that's driving this sensitivity would be these, these chemical changes that that occurs and chemical sensitization is a system wide response. Like, it's, there's a lot of different things that you can do to help it. And again, so you can, you can change that, that, that chemical, you know, um, pool, like, you know, whatever's going on in the knee without changing the structure. So again, it's not that the knee is irrelevant. It's not like, like it's all in the brain or anything like that. It's just it's something else is driving the sensitivity. And I am not a biochemist or a molecular biologist, so I do not get into any more details about I know the word cytokine, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, because I was going to say, when, when you bring that up, and I've used it before with someone as well, where it's more like there's your homeostasis in that joint is off. It was, it was okay for the time being, and you even had those arthritic changes, but now something got thrown off, and now there's this chemical sensitivity that's likely contributing to the symptoms that you're experiencing. But yeah. then when someone hits you back with, well, what, what do you mean? What is this chemical sensitivity? Like, what's the easiest way that you describe it? Uh, I'd usually, I'd say, well, let's, it's, it's a response to try to like build you up again. That's why we have a chemical sensitivity sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's the body responding to that physical load or like emotional stressors or not sleeping well. Right. So you, you must have done at some point in time, you just did too much for what you're ready to handle at the time. Uh, and then you had this re response in, in, in your knee that was meant to help you out initially. But often we do things that are meant to help us and to heal, but they hurt. That's just what, what, what we do. Right. When you have an, a, when you have like a fever, that's uncomfortable and our body aches, but that's, that's a side effect, that discomfort, but that's a good thing when we have the, the fever and all of that. That's, that's, that's our body helping us in the long term. So Neo is just a fever in the knee, you know, and, but the, if it's persistent in months and months, it's the idea that we can kind of overdo this protective response and we get, we get more sensitized to it. And then there's other things that go on with, with, with pain where we can, it's our threshold to feel that sensitivity lower. So we, we get better at it is the, the shift in thinking. Yeah. And I, I would compare the entire tissue healing process similar to dosage for loading. I think clinicians and, you know, a lot of people have a really tough time wrapping their head around this because we can't get hard numbers on it. You know, it's, like with load, yeah, I mean, there's a ton of things that you can measure at this point in time. And in terms of the dosage, if you want to get really scientific with it, like, yeah, we have a much better idea of calculating dosage for loading. But when mm -hmm. it comes to tissue healing, it's even more complex. And then doing yeah. this consistently for the average person in the average clinic, it's very challenging to do. So I think that's another reason why, well, do we want inflammation or how much do we want too much, too little? And it's, it's challenging to wrap your head around. Yeah, it is. It is. And it'll be different for everyone. Like, as you're saying, so you, you, I don't think, you know, beforehand, you're always just making educated guesses and evaluating every few weeks. Mm -hmm. All right. So that was a lot about the wear and tear versus wear and repair model. Uh, now let's <laughs> transition to, uh, when biomechanics matter. So we, we've talked a lot about joints, especially the knee joint. Let's get into, uh, and again, we can continue the conversation of even running, you know, so how much do biomechanics matter with running with the knee versus, okay, the patient comes in and they're like, well, how's, what's going on with my standing posture? Is that affecting my knee? Or do I yeah. need to be concerned about my knee position with walking? or you name it. Yeah, so to me, I, I think biomechanics matters a, a lot, but just differently than how we've traditionally viewed, viewed it. Like, yeah, the body responds to stress, that's biomechanics and load on it. But of course, we, we can't do too much too soon. We have to build up a tolerance to it and the, the person and their body and their nervous system needs to adapt. But so in that area, bi biomechanics and biology matters. But 
where we, what we've talked about through the years and what I've traditionally questioned would be things like your your knees cave in, you know, more than the average person or your foot pronates or all of these things. And it's the assumption that if you're if you run like in a in a in a manner that's not in neutral or the traditional way that you're more likely to get injured. And I've, I have, I have ish, greater issues with, with, with those ideas because I'm sort of an optimist and I think you can run this way. And I believe that we can adapt positively to these different ways of running. So the question, what's more important is getting the dosage of running down and the, re, and the recovery, right. And then, then you can, have, and you see this. You'll if you go and watch runners, you'll see massive variability in how they run. It's very hard to predict who's going to get injured or who's at more likely to get injured based on on their what we call their kinematics, which is how they look. When we were first year students in uh, PT school, I remember there was a PhD student at the program, and he would go to the Rose Bowl in Southern California just to watch people run and like get a feel for the different strategies out there. And soon after, I'm pretty sure he ditched that idea because it was, there was just too many different patterns. (laughs) There were too many different styles to run it. Yeah. And a a pretty complicated paper just came out about that where there's all, there's, you know, different phenotypes or styles of running and none of them really predisposed to, to, to injury that well. But but I shouldn't, again, I have to watch that I, I, that I don't speak in absolutes. There is like some papers, like Chris Bam, Brama is a nice, uh, well, he's a nice guy, but he's a good, I'm going to say nice researcher. He's a good researcher and a nice guy. <laughs> uh, and, and he's done, and there's a number of these papers where they find associations, right? It's not prospective where someone has knee pain and when they have knee pain, they're more likely to run often, you know, with, with maybe a, uh, uh, a, a greater I, i'm not sure what his, i can't remember his exactly but i'm getting the researchers confused i'm thinking of chris napier as well where they could have a longer stride or you know greater breaking forces or they'll be um you know sometimes hip adduction so the knee caves and so it's it's not that there isn't this associative data that you know if you if you look at hip adduction you know on average when someone has knee pain they'll have greater hip adduction it's just that it's not that great of a prospective factor. So we don't know if it may, perhaps it's, it's the pain causing the runner to run this way, or does it predispose them a little bit? But I would say like, like you don't have to change someone's running style to get them out of pain. Mm-hmm. That's again, I always look at it pragmatically. You can, that's an option to have them take shorter steps or something, but you don't have to. So again, it's another confusing area. Yeah. I mean, the entire profession of physio, it gets more confusing the more that you do it, in my opinion, because you you just learn that you have lots of options, which I think isn't a bad thing. I just think as a, as a new clinician, uh, you're always seeking patterns or hard rules because there's this give or there's this give and take to the profession of we want research and we want hard facts and rules, but the matter of the fact is, is that there's so many different options and so many different solutions to help someone that I think it maybe leads to some of these, uh, you know, some of these um, yeah. inadequate big, conclusions. Yeah. And, and big debates where we get like, we fight about little minutia. I mean, like Chris's stuff, again, Chris Brammer's work is good because again, there's those four bar- variables he found linked with pain, but then he had a great follow-up study where, this simple intervention of just taking shorter steps was enough to get people out of pain and to change most of those variables. So again, you, <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. You have an easy intervention. Sometimes mm-hmm. take more steps. There you go. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So with that being said, like over the past decade, how would you say that you've changed the way that you practice? Maybe what did you used to think in the past versus what do you do now? Um, like, Again, my fundamentals like haven't changed too much surprisingly um you know like i i was really reading the running research back in the in the 90s that was saying don't worry about pronation don't don't worry about about these things so i was again pr- pr- pretty lucky uh, i've never changed hip 
adduction, <laughs> like, um, because I was always a, a consumer of research qu qu quite young. So the fundamentals there of adaptability haven't changed. But what I've done, um, how I've really changed is what used to be like my secondary treatments, which would be like talking about load, talking about things, like coming up with planning and goal setting. Th those used to be my secondary things. My primary things would be like manual therapy and strength training. I've, I've made a shift where I don't really do that much manual therapy anymore. And I've taken the secondary, like the advice I, I would give. And I've made that the primary intervention now that like that, where I'm like a coach, like Kelly Stara talks about being a coach with people and like, mm -hmm. or someone guiding my patients or working with them. Yeah. You know? And then, and then it's sort of, um, before I would have been, yes, yeah, strength and conditioning, got to get you strong and all these things. And now I'm like, we can do that. That's one option. But I think a lot of interventions can achieve the, the positive results we need. So I'm a bit more open to other things where I might have been a bit more closed before. Like I was, I was strength and conditioning coach where so everyone got heavy load exercises. Yeah. And it's funny now people think that I challenge that all the time as if they know something I don't know. But like, I'm like, the stuff you guys are saying now, I, I was saying that a long time ago and I've just moved on where I don't think I have to do, do these things. I think it's great that you're doing it. It's just, I think there's other things we can do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, totally. I mean, yeah. it's, I, I think it's so important and valuable to just meet people with where they're at and have those tough conversations or just really try to lay the groundwork early on and, and, and guide them. You know, I'm always telling people, like, even when I teach, I try to think of myself as just like a trail guide. I don't want to for I don't want anyone to ever depend on me. I just want to help guide people in the direction that they're going. And I'm giving them advice along the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, so that's good. With that being said, I'm saying that a lot this this uh, conversation so far. <laughs> What would be your advice for clinicians that they try those things and it doesn't end up working out? Do you end up going back to examining the biomechanics? You know, it's what about some of those tougher situations? So if we stay in the, the running world, like I, I still look at everyone's biomechanics. Mm -hmm. That would be the idea. And I would still consider a changing one variable in there or yeah. some, some, some variables. Um, but I would, I would also wonder, but I always treat comprehensively, right? Like I might change gait. I might add strength training. I might change if they're running volume and all these things. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm certainly open to, to missing things. And I, I would want to talk to my patient, but what, what do you think we're missing here? You know, or, or I give them ideas. This is what we think goes on with pain, why it occurs. You know, what are some things we could work on that we're missing? So I, I, I do things like that when things are getting better. But that's when the patient finally says, oh, it might be important for me to tell you that I'm also doing a ton of hiking as well as with all of this running volume. Yeah. In small Just details. Think, 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 things like that. Hopefully yeah. I would have picked that up. But <laughs> <laughs> You and I both. You never know, though. Sometimes people just, they never correlate the small things. Yeah. All right, let's transition to the final thing that I wanted to pick your brain about today is posture and performance. And I think even with some of the performance stuff, I think you can tie in uh, some of the wear and repair stuff because I thought, I thought that was super interesting at your course where you brought up some of the studies showing we see more changes anatomically in the body with athletes, but we also don't see that that correlates with pain well. So if we can tie in all those things where it's posture, performance, and even the wear and repair, I think that'd be great. Yeah, I think posture technique, I mean, uh, matters the most for performance. Like mm -hmm. if you want to lift something overhead or, you know, produce the most force into the ground, how technique and strength coaches and other coaches are, or technique coaches are, are, are great for that. Where I think it, there, there's a problem is where we um, try to tie it into injuries. Yeah. It's just, it, again, it, it, it assumes that we, we fail to adapt or something like that, unless you have the right, right technique. And I just, all I ever see is like great performers who 
who are resilient and robust and they have deviations from normal posture and they're fine. <laughs> so I do, I do have is- issues with that. Um, Where do you so think get- we went wrong as a society where next thing you know, we start blaming posture at our desk? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sh- sure historically ha- ha- how that occurred, but it, 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 it goes back to, I think what, ha- this is what I think happens is you, you take a high load activity, like carrying buckets of water on your head or something like that. So you have 30 pounds or 30 kilograms. I don't know how much, how many liters people would carry. <laughs> and, and you, and if you're going to do that, you probably have to be upright, right? You don't want to be slouched forward. So yeah. we, we took high load activities and said, uh, and took a rule of performance from a high load activity and tried to apply it to a low load activity. That's what I think uh, happened. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, or we took the military, you know, you got to stand at attention and, you know, that's how you should be sitting at your desk for some reason. Yeah. So it all goes back to like assuming the body can adapt to deviations from neutral. But there's even an interesting study. I, I definitely don't know the author off the top of my head or all the details, but I remember reading a study about where they examined it was like neck and shoulder pain with some branch of military cadets. And even just assuming optimal posture in the position that they wanted them in didn't correlate to having less pain. Like they still even had pain in those positions. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know where that, that stuff comes from. The, the, the idea of being upright has less uh, stress on the spine isn't even supported at all. So I always quip, you know, that it's biomechanics that challenges the biomechanical ideas. Mm-hmm. When you look at the studies that measure load on the spine or EMG like uh, ac- activity um, or the EMG signal, you, when people slouch, there's less stress on a number of structures. Yeah. Right. It, it isn't necessarily easier to sit up straight. Mm-hmm. If if slouching sore, by all means, sit up straight. But if sitting up straight, I mean, this is what it, this is what's so lame. This, this advice is obvious. But and if sitting up straight is sore, then slouch like no shit. And that's sometimes like the, this common sense approach is all we need. We need to get biomechanics and research out of the way and just just do do what's almost obvious to everybody. Yeah, I evaluated a lady a couple of weeks ago, and she clearly presented with uh, cervical radiculopathy. And she came in and she swore that it was due to her bad posture. But then we take a look at the patterns of it, and you know, flexion didn't give her any issues. Like flexion was the best thing for her. It was more yeah. so, you know, being erect, being upright. She was more extension sensitive or even like, uh, you know, lower yeah. cervical flexion sensitive. And I'm like, listen, I mean, it's, there is no hard pattern to this, but don't get too caught up in thinking it's your posture at work because clearly slouching for you right now is symptom reduction and trying yeah. to sit up and trying to pull everything back and get your neck long and extended is actually making it worse. And she still had a hard time wrapping her head around it. Because it's like it's getting more and more ingrained in our in our life and our society that that's how you have to be. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you, and that's what I, I I meant that earlier when I said people are doubling down. You'll you'll definitely see people they'll they'll straw man when someone like me says posture doesn't matter the way we always said it matters. Then they'll come up with a say, oh no no, they'll come up and say no, posture is really important. And often it's for performance or it's, it's just simply symptom modification. Like, yeah, no shit. If it feels, if it feels better to sit up straight, then please sit up straight. Yeah. If you want to raise your arms over your shoulders, then work on thoracic extension. Like no one's debating that stuff. Mm-hmm. We're just saying like, there's not one ideal way to do it. You should have a repertoire of different postures. And don't worry about it so much. Yeah. And again, you brought it up earlier, like, don't, uh, don't be an absolutist or absolutist, right? There's, <laughs> there is no hard rule on anything when it comes to how the body works and how pain is interpreted. And there's just, there is no hard rule for pain. And I think the more that we get comfortable with that and understand it and respect it, the better off we'll be. Yeah, absolutely. I think the one thing that I want to finish up with uh, related to this is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like the workplace uh, paradox or like the work capacity uh, 
paradox. Yeah, the, the occupational physical activity paradox. That, that yes, stuff. That, that's, yeah. what it, that's what it is. Could you shed a little light about that topic so that for someone who is having issues, they only get pain at work, right? Or they, you know, they're caught up in that, but they don't buy into that they should be doing more outside of work. Yeah. Them. You know, I think that's a really hard thing for some people to comprehend because they're like, I need rest. I need rest. Like, why yeah. are you making me do more? It, 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 it's odd. It's, it's, so there's a few ideas in here. One is that um, people who are like physically active at work don't achieve the same health benefits from that physical activity as they would from leisure time activity. That's the, the, the paradox there. Um, but then the, the secondary idea is like, one, when you have pain at work when you're sitting or using your arms a lot or when you have a, a physically demanding job, one of the arguments is, especially if you can't change that, like you can't, you can't treat them like a runner and, and decrease their, their physical load at work. You just assume, I, ideally it'd be good if you could pull things back and let them do a little less and, or build up and have recovery weeks and all those things. But when you can't change that, the other idea is to say, well, maybe we can build a healthy tolerance to those physical loads at, at, at work. And, and this is kind of like, again, I'll use an athlete example. This is like runners. So, you know, we, we think that p part of running rehab is sometimes to do heavy strength training, right? Which sounds odd because you're getting a running related injury because you're using it a lot, we assume. Mm -hmm. But then what you do is you add more load on the system <laughs> to tolerate the loads of running. That That's sort of the idea. So, so one idea in the physical workplace or for anyone with a physically demanding job is to add just a little bit of leisure time activity of healthy behaviors that helps you tolerate the demands of your job. And that might be more sleep. That could be like spending time with friends or developing a new hobby or like going back to church, something like that. Or it could even be starting a really simple exercise program. And that's why I'm a big fan of like minimum effective dose research where, you know, you see it's the, the work, a lot of most of the work is done in men, but there's some in women as well, where um, a, a recent paper by, you know, Brad Schoenfeld showed like just 13 minutes, three times a week was enough to develop strength. And so it may be enough to build a buffer of capacity, so to speak, or maybe get some anti-inflammatory effects of exercise or I'm not sure of the mechanism, but to help people tolerate the demands of their job is the idea. Yeah, there's a lot of interest in the minimally effective dose. And for me, I have kettlebells at home. If I don't want to go to the gym, but I'm just trying to get enough stimulus, I'll just grab whatever kettlebell I'm feeling up to that day and just do tempo goblet squats until I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And at least I feel a little bit better about myself personally. No, I, I like that stuff. I like the the movement snacks or the micro fitness and mm -hmm. you know, you just do two minutes a few times a day. Like how much how much will that add up? That's, Ooh, that's sort I like of the, that. Movement snacks. Yeah, but if you there's a whole like that's a whole research area. I had a professor twenty five years ago, he didn't use that term, but he just called it lifestyle fitness. Uh -huh. of like adding these little little bouts of fitness throughout the day. What was his name? Neil. He wrote, he essentially wrote my like my grant application for, for my master's um scholarship. I owe wow. that guy like a lot of money. <laughs> well we'll we'll make sure that um he he catches this. So he I'll was amazing. Sense, yeah. McCartney? McCarthy, McCartney, Neil McCartney is awesome. Is that a McMaster? Oh, okay. All right. Well, Greg, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you uh, diving into these topics with me. I know that, you know, they're going to challenge uh, some preferences and biases out there, but I think it's fun. You know, I think that's, that's ultimately what we should be constantly doing in this field is challenging what we believe in and being open to different ideas. So I would say, is there anything else that you want to share with our viewers? Uh, what are some just easy, easy, actionable steps that people can walk away from this podcast with? Uh, I, I, I would say, like, you know, if if you are going through a change in how you think about things, um, 
you, you don't have to do like dramatically change your practice style. It's just more reconceptualizing in a bit and realizing things work for other mechanisms. And you might have to change some, some stuff, mm-hmm. but, but, but usually like, I, I think the, the, the more you understand and you recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty here, it can still simplify your practice. It just means the things that we've been worrying about aren't that important often. Mm-hmm. There's, there's like many roads to Rome here. Yeah. Uh, I say it all the time. Four plus five is the same thing as six plus three. As long as you know math, you know, you yeah. can get to the same solution in many different ways. Yeah. I think we need to do better at what are the fundamentals of recovery? Mm-hmm. What, what are the true mediators of change? That's it. You, we figure I, out those we'll all do better. I like what you said there where there's many different uh, roads to Rome. I think even adding that to help people understand patience is that also understand Rome wasn't built in a day because ultimately patience, you know, we, our patients need patience, but we also need patience with our patients. Say that 10 times in a row. Nope. (laughs) All right, Greg, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Uh, I'll be sure to include uh, your contact info and anything else that we want in the show notes. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this podcast with Greg and I. Like I mentioned on the episode, I would definitely recommend checking out Greg's course, Reconciling Biomechanics with Pain Science. You get to hang out with him for two days and he is just a book of knowledge on this stuff. So I can't recommend it enough. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Please post to social media tagging us and tagging our podcast the prehab audio experience and we'll be happy to share it also drop a comment let us know what else you want to learn about thanks again